Okay, well, we've, we've hit 10.02. I'm gonna go ahead and, um, and call the meeting to order. And may we have the roll call, please. Uh, good morning, uh, Council Member Fleming. Present. Council Member Sawyer. Here. Let the record reflect that Council Member Alvarez is not yet present. Thank you very much. And due to the provisions of the governor's executive orders in 2520 and in 2920, which suspends certain requirements of the Brown Act, and the order of the health officer of the County of Sonoma to shelter in place to minimize the spread of COVID-19, the Economic Development Subcommittee will be conducting today, to date will be conducting today's meeting in a virtual setting using Zoom webinar. Committee members and staff are participating from remote locations and or practicing appropriate social distancing. Members of the public may view and listen to the meeting as noted on the city's website and as noted on the agenda. Members of the public wishing to speak during item three, public comment, or during public hearing items will be able to do so by utilizing the raise hand fit feature, their, their raise hand feature, their hand or pressing number star nine on their phone. They, uh, they then will be given the ability to address the committee. Um, so we did the, we did the roll call public comments. Um, there are if you would, oh, sorry, go uh, ahead. I apologize, there, there is um, an individual, there are two individuals with their hand raised. Um, go ahead and uh, share the timer. And um, the first individual, um, Sarah Burton, and I apologize, Sarah, um, if you, you are allowed to unmute your line. And if you please confirm that you are able to see the timer and introduce yourself if you so choose, that would be wonderful. Yes, I can see the timer. Okay, do I begin? Yes. Okay, yeah, I, I was just um, here to speak today on behalf of my community and, and how important it is to all be together and support each other. Um, I've been in the community for um, 20 years. I've worked in hospitality my whole working career. I've worked for the Hyatt Hotel for the last 16 years. And I think these bills that need to be passed as soon as possible really protect us and strengthen our community. Um, I, I lived in Coffee Park and I was affected by the Tubbs fire. And after that, the community really came together and really supported me in, in a really hard time. And I think this is a hard time for a lot of people. And I think we need to continue to support each other in our communities. And um, you know, I have amazing coworkers that haven't been called back yet. And I know they're so unsure about, you know, their health and safety. And I feel that um, knowing that they have job security is very important and will take a lot of pressure and anxiety off of us, you know, as in hospitality. And it'll better our community as a whole. And I think um, that these ordinances are really great, like the right to call back. And it's very important for our community to stick together and um, support each other in times of need. And this is definitely one of them. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, and we do have an additional um, person with their hand raised. Um, okay, and do we have the, um, the timer um, operating? I will get it reset here. I apologize. That's okay. Um, hold on one. And Ty, you may unmute your line. Please confirm that you are able to see the timer and introduce yourself if you so choose. Yes, I can see the timer. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, council members. Uh, my name is Ty Hudson, and I uh, represent Unite Here Local 2850 which is the hotel workers union in the North Bay and in the East Bay. Um, in the city of Santa Rosa, we represent uh, workers, including housekeepers, servers, bartenders, cooks, um, and other, other employees at the Hyatt Regency. 
Um, and uh, we represent other other hotel workers in Sonoma County as well, and 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 also in the East Bay. Um, I'm here to speak about the the proposed recall rights and worker retention ordinances um, that have been brought up previously at a, at the council's um, goal setting uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, these are ordinances that that uh, Sarah mentioned um, just now that would really give hospitality workers some hope. Um, hospitality workers have been probably the most impacted of all workers in our society by the mass layoffs from the, uh, from the pandemic. Um, and there's a lot of people who have still have no idea if they will ever be able to go back to their old jobs, including people who've, who've given decades of service to their employers um, and have lived in the community a long time. Um, and uh, in order to help the community get back on its feet um, and really recover economically from the pandemic, we've got to make sure that those employees um, in this very, very important industry for, for the city and for Sonoma County are able to get back on their feet. Um, and that's what the, work, the, the recall rights and worker retention ordinances would do. Um, so we, I, we're aware that the, those ordinances have been referred to the committee, to this committee. Um, and we wanna urge this committee to take those ordinances up as soon as possible um, and, and forward them to the city council so that they can be adopted and can go into effect uh, in time for, uh, for workers to get their old jobs back um, and, and recover as, as the vaccine rolls out and the economy recovers. Um, really appreciate your attention um, and uh, we'll look forward to working with you as these ordinances move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Ty. Eileen, any other um, live public comments? We do, hold just one moment. Um, Maddie, you may unmute your line. Please confirm that you are able to see the timer and introduce yourself if you so choose. Yeah. Yeah, I can see the timer. Um, Maddie Hirschfield, political director with the North Bay Labor Council. Uh, I just wanted to quickly add my two cents about the right of recall and retention um, and just mention that this is a no cost to the employer. And uh, we, what we don't want is to see this pandemic used as a way to retaliate against employees by not asking them back. Um, many of these, these folks have been working at these hotels for decades they consider their coworkers and the, and the regular uh, customers, their family. And it would just be a, a kindness, a real kindness to these workers to uh, uh, give them a light at the end of a tunnel so they know that they're going to get their jobs back. Um, that's really all I have to say. Thank you so much, uh, council members. I know you'll do the right thing. Thanks, Maddie. Eileen, any others? Uh, we do. Um, one moment, please. Um, Marty, if you would please, um, you may unmute your line and please confirm that you are able to see the timer. Um, I think she just spoke. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Marty Bennett. Oh, Marty, sorry. Am I, am I on? Yes, you are. Are you able to see the timer? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marty Bennett. Um, I'm also with this staff of Unite Here Local 2850, representing hotel, casino, um, food service workers uh, in the East Bay and the North Bay. I just wanted to briefly add um, to the comments about the importance of agendizing uh, proposed right of recall, right of retention. And it would only cover hotels um, with more than 50 rooms. Uh, we believe there's about 13 or 14 in the community. Um, I think it's also important uh, to emphasize that this is a racial uh, justice and racial equity issue as the catastrophic layoffs in the hospitality industry have disproportionately impacted uh, women and people of color um, many of whom work in relatively low wage jobs uh, and have little savings to ride out, you know, the pandemic. Um, and we're really asking you to help these workers recover um, along with the rest of the community. Um, 
And I think it's also important to add that we have a, a huge displacement crisis, um, particularly amongst low wage workers who have to leave the community because they've lost their job. Um, and this is really going to help folks stay in the community, have the economic security that they're going to get their jobs back and enable them to become productive workers in the hospitality sector and to get that sector up and running as soon as possible during the recovery. So thanks very much. Thank you, Marty. Any others, Ms. Clary? We do. Um, Sherry Corbell, um, you may unmute your line. Please confirm that you are able to see the timer and introduce yourself if you so choose. Uh, thank you, and yes, I am able to see the timer. So hopefully everybody can hear me. We can. So um, good morning, all council members, uh, members of the subcommittee, since you all the both and staff. My name is Sheree Cabral, and I am the secretary treasurer for the North Bay Building and Construction Trades Council. And um, I'm just here this morning to ask you to agendize the discussion of a project labor agreement relative to uh, city public works and public infrastructure as a priority item looking at how we can utilize dollars that are, are being expended by the city in the form of infrastructure projects as an economic development tool, not only um, just for economic security and strength, strength, but also addressing environment, addressing equity, addressing um, really resiliency on a local basis from an economic development perspective when it comes to um, providing individuals with not only opportunity, but an education in um, a skilled craft that allows them to earn a considerable and self-supporting sustaining wage that's consistent with the cost of living up in the North Bay. Um, so with that, you probably hear the, the rattling. I am on the road and driving, so <laughs> I won't subject you to too much of it much longer. Um, but I want to say thank you for your time this morning, and we look forward to working with you to really figure out how to craft a policy from the city's perspective that, that allows, um, allows not only an issue of, of economic resiliency, but a continued self-sufficiency in the North Bay that, from the jobs perspective. So thank you guys this morning and um, a wonderful meeting. Thanks, Sherry. Ms. Clary, any more public comments? There are, there are no additional hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you very much. So at, at this point, um, we will move to our um, new business and 3.1. Uh, the COVID-19 paid sick leave federal policy update and next steps. And um, we will have Raisa De La Rosa um, give us a, an update if you would, please. Yeah, it's a quick update and an easy update. So um, there were uh, changes um, made to the FMLA, but it is um, the only thing that applies to the uh, paid sick leave ordinance is that they extended the tax credit um, from March 31st until uh, September 30th. Um, so the way we wrote our ordinance, oh, if we could elevate Jeff Burke as well in case he has um, anything to add, uh, Claire, that would, I'm mean, sorry, Claire, um, Eileen, that would be, um, that would be great. Um, Can I apologize, but, uh, Raisa, who was it that you would like me to? Oh, Jeff Burke. Oh, certainly, thank you. Um, so yeah, so it extends it and the way we wrote our ordinance um, allows us just to carry forward and to extend it now to, um, to uh, September 30th. Um, there are other things that um, affect FMLA, but not anything that is per pertinent to the paid sick leave. Um, but uh, I think if Jeff, do you, is there anything you wanna add um, to this? I think that was the only thing that, that affected us. 
No, I think that's a good summary. They did uh, basically just simply extend the voluntary nature uh, and the tax credits continued through September 30. And the way we wrote our ordinance was that it would sunset March 31st or if the feds extended it that later date. So our ordinance will simply remain in effect through September 30th and we don't need to make any changes. So that's it. Excellent. Council member Fleming, any questions? Um, if it's all right, I would like just to make a comment, which is that I'm really pleased that, you know, as it, that we were able to write the ordinance, um, thank you to staff and the council um, for staying on this and um, having the, the foresight to sort of um, make these contingency plans. And this will save the general council um, a lot of work and difficulty and um, ensure some pr uh, predictability for our business and labor communities as well. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, you know, if you want to, I can just tell you, I, we've the number of calls we've received have been um, very low on this, um, and I think uh, just because it was of interest last time, it just popped into my head because I talked to somebody yesterday. Um, they were, um, it, I've only received like two calls from people with businesses over 500, and the nuances of that requirement. Um, there's still some degree of confusion on it, but overall, it has not. Our the number of calls or questions or concerns um, have been minimal. So I think that's actually a good. Uh, <laughs> it bodes well for us um, extending it on. Yeah, I, I was concerned about the confusion out there, and it sounds like. Um, people have um, accessed the right kind of information and accurate information to allow them to move forward without too much difficulty and without too much confusion. So my, my, my concerns about that have not been realized and that is, um, that's positive. I appreciate that report. Yeah, there are really odd nuanced confusion. Like it's just amazing to me the questions that can pop up, but um, luckily the FAQ from the federal site is still up and it addresses almost any crazy nuance question. Um, and so that's been a good resource as well. But we've definitely, definitely seen um, a downturn in the number of questions or um, oddities that have, that have popped up. Outstanding. Do we have any public comment on this particular item, Eileen? We have no public comments at this time. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, do we have to, do, do we, we, we don't have to um, announce any recorded uh, or other uh, e-comments in this environment, do we? Um, we do not have either um, uh, e-comments or, e or voicemail for this meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Well, in that case, if we have no other um, comments or questions, by council, um, then we can move on to the Roseland program update, which I'm very much looking forward to hearing. It, it, all, it, even if it is brief, it's, it sounds like, uh, I'm just looking forward to hearing some, some positive things coming out of our efforts in Roseland. Um, for this, I need to have, uh, I'm gonna introduce Raphael, and I think he is just going to be popping up here in a second. Excellent. There he is. Um, Raphael, can, are you, um, are you Hello. available? Start my video. There you go. <laughs> we hear him. Hello there. Um, good morning, Chair Sawyer, Council Member Fleming. Hello, Raisa. Good morning. And everyone else uh, participating on this call. Uh, happy Tuesday. So my name is Raphael Rivera. I'm uh, an employee of the uh, Economic Development Division. Uh, economic development specialist here at the city of Santa Rosa. So yes, I do have a brief and quick update related to Rosen, uh, and I will be describing some of the efforts there over the past couple of weeks and perhaps uh, months, um, but I'm delighted to do so because it's a very exciting area to uh, work in and uh, again, getting to know uh, the residents there, the business owners, and uh, uh, all of the effort that uh, that we've been working on over the past, uh, we're coming around the third year of, uh, actually no, the fourth year of the uh, annexation, I think, uh, well, in November. 
So, um, so we have continued to do our weekly calls. Uh, this is a joint effort with the uh, county's EDB. Uh, the calls uh, average uh, a number of between 16 to 21 participants. These are weekly calls that we hold uh, on Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. I do this uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a joint effort with the county's EDB, but many Rosen business owners participate on these calls. Uh, the goal would be to eventually at some point begin having just the calls with the Roseland business owners. Uh, we do get um, a couple of business owners from other uh, municipalities throughout the county, but the calls basically um, discuss or address uh, or talk about uh, reopening, um, vaccination and testing sites, uh, so information related to that, COVID-19 uh, sick leave ordinances, so we have discussions related to that and provide that information to the business owners uh, for uh, those business owners to pass uh, the information to their employees. And uh, we have also talked about uh, outdoor operation protocols. Uh, every so often we have the counties, one of the counties PIO uh, on the calls, as well as some other guests uh, to provide um, uh, motivation and leadership and uh, resiliency um, uh, 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 points so people can uh, again uh, not give up and continue operating each day under this pandemic uh, unusual circumstances. Uh, in terms of outreach and communications we um, when I say we it's just basically me uh, for the most part uh, but I'll continue to use we because it sounds like there's a lot of people perhaps. <laughs> uh, I've delivered or we've delivered uh, 32 flyers related to the uh, second round of California grants uh, I'm not exactly sure how many people took advantage of that, but it was just an effort to provide that information to the uh, business owners who typically don't have access to this information, whether they, because of access to technology or whatnot, but um, uh, we deliver uh, at least 32 flyers out into the community so they could take advantage of these grant opportunities, especially around the second round, which the deadline came very quickly. And I also brought flyers to uh, related to the second round of PPP, especially during the last two weeks. It was very specific to businesses that were under 20 employees or so. And the deadline, I think it's today at 5 p.m. Um, uh, we are actually currently drafting a threefold brochure. And this idea came about a couple of months ago. Uh, we have gotten a lot of inquiries from uh, uh, food operators and food vendors, food uh, vending entrepreneurs. So um, in some of the calls that we participated uh, late last year related to the uh, outdoor dining over at the Roseland Village, um, some of the county folks and myself came uh, to the conclusion that we just needed a more comprehensive outreach effort in terms of providing this information to the uh, entrepreneurs interested in opening food vending uh, carts and trucks and whatnot. So we're producing a threefold brochure and uh, that will provide information related to ordinance, uh, what you can do, uh, how to get the, uh, the permits, how to go about uh, operating in that realm uh, related to starting a uh, food vending business. Uh, this hasn't been done in the past, so uh, we feel pretty good about it. So it's in its first review right now with the city planners, and then it will later go to the uh, county. But basically, it's a joint effort between the county and the city, and um, it will be a threefold brochure. And the idea is basically to educate folks and, um, and um, let them know that we are here to assist them uh, with their questions and answers. So uh, that is the purpose for that. Um, we, oh, Phil, can I ask a question about yes. since you're on that topic? Um, I I don't mean to interrupt your your, no, your screen, but um, is the is the city phasing uh, so that people can kind of get up to speed when it comes to the the requirements of the city and um, the the whatever uh, changes that some of the vendors may be having to deal with, which some might be costly, some may not be, but but be bringing up to speed. The, the the business owners if there are issues around cost and um, just are are we are we offering an, a, a kind of a an, an ability for those for the businesses to kind of um, give them some time to come up to speed 
uh, to speak in terms well, of- Well, it, 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 does, it, does, this, does this pamphlet, um, which is geared toward the businesses, does it also have to do with, with um, uh, re city, requi city requirements as far as their, their structures or, the, it, it, or did, I, did I miss the boat on that, on that conversation? Yeah, th this for sure, it's actually specific to food vending. So it will include information related to um, uh, conditional use permit uh, how to go about uh, connecting with the uh, county's environmental health and safety and all of their requirements, um, letting these uh, business food vending entrepreneurs know that they'll need to uh, acquire a business license. So it's more specific to the food vending uh, individuals. Right. So we're giving them time to kind of learn about the new uh, requirements that they may that they may be under and so that so as not to be um, so as not to hinder their ability to conduct business while they are um, starting to, to um, supply the county with the, with all the records and permits and requirements it's just a matter of, of, of timing as opposed to uh, what they have to do and just give, giving them kind of cutting some cut, cutting them some slack I guess is really what I'm looking looking to um, yeah, yeah, I would say timing so. wise, it's basically uh, an educational item or uh, material. So um, they're not necessarily calling so many other people or getting confused out there. And uh, this kind of lays it out more clearly. Okay. And, uh, we're, we're, you know, at this point, once they have that material in their hands, we'll be able to walk them through it very quickly. Uh, they, you know, it's basically, it also has to do with building that trust and making sure that they know that they can approach the city at any time and ask questions and not be hindered by, you know, the language barrier or the fact that maybe they came down here, they knocked on the door and they didn't, you know, the other person on the other side didn't uh, understand them or uh, so. The brochure Excellent. will be done in Spanish and English, um, but we do, we have an uptake in, in requests uh, or, or phone calls related to, hey, I want to start my own uh, food vending business. How do I go about it? So that's one of the reasons we decided to come up with this idea. Okay. Well, I think it's a great idea. It's the new normal, and sometimes new normals can be can create anxiety. So I'm just, I'm, just, I, I, I'm glad to hear that that, that these things are being um, that, that the user friendliness of this is really important to me. Yeah, and it will include also a landing page. So I'm working with uh, one of our staff members to produce that. Uh, and again, uh, since a lot of 80% of these inquiries uh, are from Spanish speakers, uh, it will be in, in Spanish as well, this uh, web uh, landing page. Um, but uh, what, what, what pleases me about this project is that we're collaborating with the county. So uh, when I came to this division almost three years ago, you know, we didn't uh, not that we didn't talk with the county, but uh, the county uh, environmental health and safety just seemed like a very obscure place. And uh, a lot of people that we, uh, that I started speaking with, uh, didn't necessarily gave, always gave positive uh, feedback related to that particular agency. So uh, this has kind of opened it up for, for us and we're collaborating together. And we just want everybody out there who's vending, who's selling food and operating a, a vehicle, cart, uh, that they have the proper, you know, documentation, permits, whatever, and that uh, they're doing it safely. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, quickly down the list. Uh, so again, uh, the collaboration with the Environmental Health and Safety. Um, I learned uh, this week, uh, or maybe late last week, that the uh, Mito Mitote Food, uh, food Court, uh, they're having a, a uh, Zoom meeting tomorrow with the uh, Midpen uh, developers, uh, the builder, and asked to discuss the uh, the schedule and logistics around the eventually the building of the Mitote Food Park, which for clarification, the uh, uh, outdoor dining at the Rosen Village is not Mitote yet. Mitote will be built at some point sometime soon, sometime this year. But that's the uh, food park with uh, surrounded pens and banners and uh, the rotating food trucks, et cetera. And uh, it's basically another form of outdoor dining, but uh, it will be more, uh, it'll be, uh, you know, it'll have a structure and such uh, over at the Roseland Village. 
Uh, so they're having that meeting tomorrow. So I'll follow up with uh, some of the operators and such, and I'll provide an update uh, hopefully next month. And my then, mouth is um, my mouth is watering. <laughs> yeah, there's some pretty good food there. Yeah, I was just thinking that we need to have a um, a visit uh, day. Yeah, I think I agree. <laughs> All right, so then lastly, uh, what's coming up is that we're continuing to work, and I was hoping um, Council Member Alvarez uh, was um, on this call, uh, but I'll follow up with him definitely. It looks like he's joined. Oh, okay. I uh, see uh, him. Almost see him. <laughs> he's arriving. Oh, <laughs> All right. So oh, almost see me. Almost see me. There he is. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. So, um, so we've continued to work on a comprehensive directory. So that uh, has taken a little bit of time. Uh, there are so many different businesses in the Roseland area that I, uh, there's at least 13 related automobile uh, businesses, 17 hair salons. Uh, I haven't gotten to the food part yet, but this is gonna be a very comprehensive uh, directory. It's very exciting because it's getting me the opportunity to meet some of these people, some of these business, business owners. And then at the end, we'll have a full comprehensive directory. What we're going to do with that exactly, I'm not sure, but um, at least we'll know uh, the, uh, the lay of the land, basically. Um, looking for dates to hold uh, a meeting for uh, business leaders of the area. And um, I'm hoping to uh, approach uh, Council Member Alvarez to get some input related to that. Uh, speaking to one of the planners right after this call, uh, they have a survey uh, out there, the uh, the city planners uh, related to the uh, general plan update, and I, I believe they're seeking for more uh, input from the Spanish speaking community. And uh, there's also uh, I'm helping promote a uh, an EDB county uh, workshop related to uh, the moving to tier red, and that's happening tomorrow at noon. Uh, there's one uh, being held in Spanish at 12:30, so. I'm hoping that many of the business owners take advantage of listening to, to that workshop or that update. Uh, so that uh, concludes my update. And uh, do you have any questions for me? Council, any questions or comments before I move to the public? Um, Council member Alvarez has his hand raised. Thank, thank you. Uh, Rafa, can you send me a Zoom invite for that meeting that, that's being held uh, with the Mikote group, please? Absolutely. And, and, and it's also important to, to recognize that, I, I, from my understanding, there's only actually one auto dealer left on Sebastopol Road when it comes to the vehicles. Uh, other additional uh, businesses are mechanics and, and things of that nature. Is, is that correct? On special yeah, there's a couple of body shops. I mm -hmm. mentioned automobile services. Um, yeah, but uh, that includes and, and, a lot of body shops, tire shops. Exactly. And the reason I bring that up is it's important to, to recognize that Roseland specifically is very, very in tune with the, with the pedestrian, the, the walking opposed to the vehicle. And I think the lack of uh, car dealerships that we now see on Sebastopol Road compared to about 10 years ago uh, goes, goes towards that, uh, that, 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 that feeling that when it comes to carbon reduction, we actually are, are primed for that. So especially with the, with the bike and, and, and things of that nature, the Joe Rodota being specific, uh, perfect example of that, we, we could definitely move to more of a, a pedestrian friendly, which, which we thought that is actually perfect for that because it's exactly on the side of, of West Avenue, which is the corridor for all the neighbors. So, so again, it's perfectly situated. And I, and I'm, and, and I also want to thank you for the assistance that you've been given to all the people that have been sending your way uh, for the signs in, in the oh, yeah. shop and the, and the body of hamburgers, which which actually I spoke to her just a few days ago, and she's still uh, interested, so expect to hear from her again. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, that's that's it. It's just building that relations, building those relationships, building that trust, and letting people know that we're here to provide some information and guidance. Thanks, Mr. Alvarez. You know, I, I have a question, uh, Rafael. I know this may sound like a pretty basic concept, but it has to do with place finding or wayfinding. Does do or do the poles, do our light poles or whatever other receptacle we are using for our banners, are those installed on Sebastopol Road? And are the are are are, are the community uh, meetings um, discussing 
the some kind of an, an emblem or a, a kind of a when you know you've you're you're in Roseland, you've got this you know you've got banners on the poles, you you've arrived uh, to this uh, special part of of our community. Has there been any conversation about banners on Sebastopol Road or just in the in the general area of Roseland? To your knowledge. Um, well, uh, interestingly enough, I mean, we survey uh, Sebastopol Road. There are, I forget how many poles, but it'd be uh, the dual Cobra type. And currently there's only three banners um, uh, from the old neighborhood program. Uh, they do say Roseland, but you can just barely see it. Um, I know that Santa Rosa City Water is interested in uh, putting up banners and then uh, TPW uh, in late December, also expressed some interest in uh, displaying banners related to their uh, uh, mascot campaign. Mm -hmm. So I'll need to follow up with them. Uh, they do not currently have the brackets, uh, which is not necessarily an issue, but um, we, I, I would definitely, I mean, that's part of the, the vision under this, uh, uh, it's an, it's an in-house initiative, but we're definitely carrying this out. They're also in business engagement. I would love to see banners up there. I would like to say uh, an arch, you know, sign uh, welcoming residents to to uh, wel welcoming uh, visitors to Roseland. And uh, I think there's so much more that you know could be achieved. Uh, but um, yeah, I, and I, if I can add to that, I mean, one of the things that Rafael and I talk about a lot are um, sort of the steps towards getting to those broader placemaking elements. And um, we've included, uh, so the team, in addition to, of course, Eileen and Rafael, who are on this right now, includes Tara Thompson, who's our arts and culture manager. And so we're looking at sort of all the pathways through which we can have a greater placemaking um, presence there. Um, but uh, you know, when Raphael started, he talked about some of the organizational um, development sort of things that he's doing there. So it's um, lacking a, an association or, you know, before there wasn't like exactly a lot of, um, of uh, all businesses talking to all other businesses. I mean, because there's a wealth of diversity in that area. Um, and so the foundational element of this is making sure that there is a group and a known sort of gathering place and a place that they know that they can come through Raphael um, to, uh, to sort of interact with the city. Um, and then from there, we're looking at um, placemaking opportunities that include um, banners, that include maybe facade improvements through maybe the art program, that type of thing. And then um, also, if there's a possibility of doing like community benefit district type of uh, situation, then there would be funding to do additional things like um, like you're seeing in Railroad Square and downtown with the Downtown Action Organization. So it's yeah. a sort of a long strategy um, to get there and all of that is within consideration. I, I, I figured that it was, and I just wanted to, since we kind of had that banner conversation uh, recently, I just want to make sure that we were on track. Um, Mr. Alvarez, you had your hand up. Was that before, or, or would you like to make a comment or question? I did, but I noticed that Councilman uh, Fleming's hand was up before I was. Well, M Ms. Fleming, how about, how about you? Thanks, John. Um, so the other thing I wanted to add to this is, um, you know, how exciting it is, the idea of having the community benefit district in Roseland. Um, and then what I'm hopeful for is that we have um, sort of like an association of community benefit districts where um, we can work together to not just have these um, place making things like the, but the wayfinding so that people can, you know, they might land in Courthouse Square when they first visit Santa Rosa, but then they can easily find themselves, you know, through different arrows and signs and flags meandering through Roseland or and back around through Railroad Square um, with some amount of ease. I know that there's a lot of infrastructure and, and changes that need to happen, but I think that the downtown um, station area plan was pretty clear that, that this is something that we want to move toward and anything that we can do to make sure that Roseland and Railroad Square and Courthouse Square are um, easily flow into one another for pedestrian traffic would be something that I'd be in support of. Yeah, it's a great idea when you think about it, getting from Railroad Square to Roseland is a straight shot. I mean, it's, 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 so a, it's basically a left-hand turn and a right-hand turn and you're there. Right. Um, and so it's, it's, it's just a matter of 
getting it done. So I, I think that's a, that's a great idea. We, we need wayfinding all over the city, but that would be a, probably a pretty easy fix. Yeah. I, and that, uh, did, you, did, did, did you want to respond to that, Raphael? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, quickly. Uh, so um, I'm working, uh, I'm not part of the committee, but I'm facilitating these meetings between the Rebel Square Association and and our city staff on their the uh, wayfinding project for Rebel, Rebel Square, uh, they have proposed 12 signs. Uh, I, I will mention to them that we need one pointing to Rosen, but uh, over and over we keep hearing that we want to, uh, not, not, not we as in the city, uh, obviously we have an interest in this, but I continue to hear this over and over again, Rosen as a destination. So we definitely, at some point, uh, need to look at that and eventually let the, uh, the visitors the tourists and other residents from other areas throughout the city, you know, point into that direction. This is a, a destination where you can find food, where you can find uh, 12 related uh, auto car, uh, car dealer, uh, not dealerships, uh, related businesses, 17 salons, uh, so many restaurants and so on. So. Uh, wayfinding project uh, eventually will come at some point, um, but uh, those poles can serve uh, in the meantime as some sort of uh, way, wayfinding um, uh, 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 tool or, or, or feature. Yeah. Uh, but again, we need to do some planning around that and there's gotta be you know, a committee driving that and so on. And I want to sure. hear what Councilmember Alvarez has to say, but then I can take a step back and sort of to, um, make some connections here so you can see where we're going. Oh, oh, please, please, raise a, 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 the, with the flow of thoughts, please, please continue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Because um, I think that the big thing is like we've identified yes, marketing, which is what Rafael just is talking about. It's like that destination piece of it, um, but we also have that infrastructure piece of it. And so Councilmember Alvarez actually touched on this. It is a total like the the. Um, it's an ideal location just in the way people move around that area. It's a walkable site, but it, it's lacking a lot of the infrastructure pieces of it. And again, that placemaking piece of it. Um, so we're only just, so I just noted on this, we, we need to identify all the community partners because I like where you're going with this. Councilmember Fleming with, um, it's that association of, of um, associations, basically. It's like, how is the Railroad Square Association, community, uh, downtown action organization and Roseland, once it gets um, an association, how are they working together? But you know, the challenge and I think our opportunity is what do we do now until there is a district, a benefit district in Roseland? It takes like a year to do that. So we're looking right now, and this sort of gets into three point, um, the item 3.3 .3, um, on how are we gonna start looking at, um, at all of the initiatives that we have with, with currently what is very little money. Um, so like if we're looking at community partners to do that wayfinding, it's not just the city, it's not just the associations or even the nascent organization that is in Roseland, um, but there's also the Museum of Sonoma County, for example, they have an interest in playing in this space. Um, the chamber has an interest in playing in this space. The Hispanic chamber, I should say the chambers, um, because there's the um, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Black Chamber of Commerce, and the San Rosa Metro Chamber. Um, and I think um, I'm seeing opportunity before we have funds in looking at assembling sort of the layers of needs there that I think gets to be exciting. And then I think we need to talk about um, what that looks like in terms of infrastructure, because again, um, Roseland um, with an historic under, um, like we've under, what's the word? We haven't put a lot of money there. <laughs> uh, and the county didn't put a lot of money there. So how do you get it to catch up? Um, and then last thing I'm gonna say on that, um, it's um, one of our, we have two sources of funding in this um, division. It's uh, main sources, it's the general funds and it's the um, tourism business improvement area funds. Um, the tourism business improvement area funds have been decimated. However, they won't always be that way. Like we're less than zero on those, but as um, the economy opens up and where San Sonoma County is really just ripe for, um, for local tourism. So we won't be as hard hit. We don't get international tourism, but we'll get in probably we're anticipating an increase in local sort of stateside tourism. So that should pick up. 
So we're looking already at where are the programs that help to um, advance sort of equity, access, inclusion in these discussions. And we can use some of those things for placemaking. So that could be in combination with like art funds, um, a placemaking thing. That could be where um, we do an initial infusion of banner pole hardware um, to get them to at least the same place as where railroad square and courthouse square are. So um, I just want to say like those are all of the considerations as we're looking at money and opportunity um, and taking this sort of lull in um, financing to prepare ourselves for when we can actually act with the funds that we need. Great. Thanks, Raisa. Mr. Alvarez. Uh, first and foremost, I, I, I love the amount of, of focus that we're dedicating to Rosalind, our newest member of San Rosa. And really it is about opportunity, not so many, not so much the obstacles that, that lay before us. And, and to, to thought came a conversation that I had with Omar Gallardo uh, from Bayer Farms. And he brought up a, a big arch, which I know there's a certain group in Rosalind that's now working on theirs. I won't give up the name because I know they want to come out with a great surprise, but yet a big arch that welcomed the people to the community. That because of traffic might not be possible, but it's something that we spoke about maybe 20, 25 years ago. And then the conversation came up where, what if we, we, we redid the artwork underneath the, the, the Olive Street Bridge, which welcomed both the, 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 the traffic entering Roseland, leaving Roseland, entering Roadwood Square, or leaving Roadwood Square. And, and, and really the, the, the incorporation of art with, with the banners, the, 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 the information or, 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 or geographical uh, position that you're in, a wayside, I believe it's called. And I thought, what a great idea. I don't know the implications because of, of, of Caltrans, which I'm sure there are plenty, but nonetheless, though, just the, the amount of, of vision that's coming from the community into a better Roseland, into a better Santa Rosa, is very inspiring. And, and really, I think this is a culmination of it, of how much focus we're dedicating to our newest member. So I just really wanted to point out that that as a, as, as, as a Santa Rosan, as a, a native from Roseland, is very exciting to see, and I, and I do appreciate it. Well, I, I appreciate those comments, and and it would be great. I mean, I love the idea of an archway. I know uh, the, the fire department hates things spanning over streets. <laughs> for we can fire do it, though. We can do it. We can do it. And yeah, it would be, I mean, I mean they said okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's a classic way. I know in, in, in many areas in Mexico, there is, you'll, you will almost always go under an arch that, that, that says you've arrived. And I, I love that idea. And we do have some, a fair amount of catch up to do in Roseland. And there, there will be a time in the not too distant future, and maybe it's already happening when visitors come into Healdsburg or Sonoma and uh, they start talking to other um, tourists and they, they're, they're bound to say, you really need to check out uh, the Roseland district of Santa Rosa because it's lots of great food and lots of great everything. And so they're gonna need to know when they've arrived and as, as will the citizens of Santa Rosa. So I think anything that we do in that venue or in that, in that regard will be um, certainly supported by me. And I know I'm not alone. I, I, I look forward to that day. Any, uh, so like, let's, we, I guess it would be time now for public comment on the Rosen program update. Do we have anything, Eileen? We do not. There are no raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Any final comments, council or questions? All right, so then we'll, do, then if, assuming there are no uh, um, other types of comments from the community written or electronic or otherwise, um, and that is true, Eileen, we don't have any other comments. That's right. We don't have um, we don't have pre-recorded. We don't do that. We don't do the written the, the oh, written piece either. Right. And we we actually do solicit them. I just want to clarify, um, but we do not have any for this meeting. Okay. Good enough. I'm I'm not I haven't shared that many meetings on Zoom, so I'm a, I, I need a little hand holding, and I appreciate the help. Um, Moving to 3.3 economic resiliency planning, um, Ms. De La Rosa, you want to introduce this item? Yeah, so, um, you know, what we were really looking at, um, you can go to the next slide, Eileen. 
Um, or actually, you know what, I don't even know if we need this slide quite yet, but um, well, it's fine, it's there. Um, you know, what, what we were talking about before is like really identifying and prioritizing a policy program and project goals. Um, as it says on the um, on the uh, agenda, I think. Um, but it's how do we how do we take? I think that the reason why I wanted to follow up on this is it can, uh, is resulting from the economic resiliency conversation that happened at council during goal setting. There were a lot of things that came up, and then also, you know, we went through everything that we did last time uh, at the last meeting. Um, and what you see on this slide is really. Um, the carry forward items, I kind of rebucketed them, them to be into um, policy programs and projects, but it's um, the it's the question of how do we look at sort of uh, what we what was successful for us in the task force, um, move them forward, accept new projects and programs and ideas, but then also align it and have that further conversation from all of the things that came up uh, during the council goal setting for the economic um, resiliency uh, component of that discussion. Um, so it's, and I think um, council member Fleming said this in the, um, in the goal setting meeting, the, the full council goal setting meeting, but we've talked about it too, is as we're looking at things, we have um, to consider, you know, the uh, capacity, a capacity of, of the staff throughout the city, because not everything rests to be clear in economic development, um, the budget needs or budget constraints and other resources. Um, and so when we're considering those and then we're looking at things that came up um, today, for example, like the um, you know right to recall or ordinances that um, that are being proposed by the community or other things that are coming in. How do we place those? And then, especially if it's going to be policies, as we're moving from COVID urgency ordinances into other non you know urgency ordinances, um, how do we prepare for the time it takes? to do really due diligence to understand the true needs. And then the last thing I'm gonna say, cause I think this is gonna be sort of a free for all conversation amongst us, um, capturing this and many other things is um, another thing that came up at the council uh, goal setting was surveying um, the uh, business community um, uh, to understand what are their true needs for action or, um, or uh, policy changes from the local or even non-local uh, area. And so we've been working with um, the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber to, um, to craft a survey um, and they're open to uh, sending it out beyond their membership. And so we'll probably loop in other, um, other chambers as well to try to get a broader uh, perspective based on the, um, on the surveys that, that um, are being put out. So that's sort of like the overall space that can lead us more, but I'm kind of curious in having a more organic discussion of what you guys are thinking or like, how do we move this forward based on the conversation that you guys had at council? Good question. <laughs> Let's, um, let, me, let me just entertain questions or comments from, um, from the council members, because because it is how we move forward with this many things on our list, and it's not it's it's not as though we have yet we haven't um, prioritized these yet, and that that and we have been uh, we we have a history of of being very uh, proactive uh, in, in certain areas, and so I. I I also have a question about, about which ones do which which issues do we bring before the council for a full conversation and what items uh, as they move around um, how we would how we would actually prioritize these um, and we are we have yet to receive our the documents around council goal setting and that will happen not by our next meeting but potentially by the meeting after that we will have some we will be we will have captured the comments from council as far as those areas that fall within our purview that the council has weighed in on about priorities so this is a, a great um, encapsulation of what we've been looking at over the over these last many months um, but we still have a uh, we still have that that prioritization piece and the um, the capturing of the public comments from goal setting that we will be that will help inform our next steps. 
So yeah, and um, this list is not the end all be all. This is just what we had because again, new things came up both at council and we anticipate new things being um, proposed by the community. And just to be clear, if it's highlighted under these programs, like if it's green, then under projects, then we're actually currently working on those. Um, like under programs, working capital for small business, we have no working capital. <laughs> I mean, we have no funds for a working capital program. So that's why that's black, not orange. If, just to make clear what that means. Excellent. No, I think that uh, was a great way to do it, I think. Um, council, uh, any uh, questions at this point? Uh, Ms. Fleming. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, one of the things that I was, uh, I, well, one of the things I wanted to note is that what I think made the economic um, development or the the emer the recovery, economic recovery task force, is that what we called ourselves? Yeah. It yeah. Was. Yes. Uh, successful was that we, we set an environment of just the, of free flow of ideas and that nothing like what Raisa said, it, you know, it was informal that nothing was you know, there were no bad ideas. We didn't do everything. And so um, I'm just hopeful that we can bring forward that sort of spirit to this. And I'm curious from the, from John and Rice and Raphael to know what you think was really helpful and worked in that process, because this is different. You know, it is recorded, it is public, which I think is an added benefit to us, frankly. But, um, and then also the council is going to, I mean, I know the council assigned uh, us to look at um, right of first recall and, you know, may want us to look at project labor agreements. So we're going to have, you know, things that, and, but we dealt with that before too, when the council wanted us to look at work and capital. So, uh, you know, I, yeah. I, that, that it's not impossible, but I'm very curious to know what elements you felt made this successful in the past. It was 100% what you just said. What was successful to you was 100% successful to us. It was the ability to have honest, open conversations. And, you know, we, we never talked. It was closed because it was an ad hoc, but we never said anything that I don't think we could say here, right? Um, right. Because sometimes you have to, in order to pick at it from different angles, um, it was the level of comfort to say something that may not be popular or that will maybe really anger um, one constituency. But if we didn't ask that question, we wouldn't be able to circle it around and understand why, like either how to answer it or how to make a better um, uh, process. So my, like, I am just desperately trying to hang on to that level of comfort of conversation mm -hmm. and the free flow of ideas when we get to these things within the confines of having to have a brown an agenda that says, this is what we're actually gonna be talking about. Like, how do you make it sort of broader to be able to, to bring it up? Okay. I, I love, and I'm sorry, I didn't, well, I did mean to interrupt because I did. So I, I apologize for interrupting, but I, I'm, gonna, I'll, I'm gonna make a, 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 take the chair's prerogative and remove um, titles from this if you guys if, if the council members are okay um if i can just use first names i think that that at the one step in the direction of, of removing some formality that we 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 were able to take advantage of d during the task force was that sense of comfort removing formality allowing the free flow, flow of, of, of ideas just like you were talking about victoria and raisa i think it helps to set a tone and we need that, we need to make sure that that tone is comfortable. That's, that it worked then and I think it'll work now. Eddie, did you, did you have a, a comment you'd like to make? Of course, <laughs> uh, I, I agree. And then back to Victoria because I cut her off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I agree and I love that we're much more informal to get the job done. And, and yeah. I believe the formalities might, might be the resistance. I wasn't here during those conversations, but I love that we do have that understanding amongst ourselves. And um, to be super clear, we were, um, uh, we didn't mind cutting each other off because the, the ideas <laughs> kept going faster. So. The, the, flow, the flow of ideas, don't stop them once they start happening. Absolutely. Yeah. We Absolutely. would get rather excitable. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, a good I, thing. I think that was great. I think it was great that we, we just sort of all jumped in, um, if that's okay with John. Um, and uh, um, we'll just leave him with the hard work of calling roll and, um, you know, keeping us on task. But, but I, I think that that was really helpful um, in generating things. And then 
you know, we were able, I mean, obviously John is a, a re retailer, you know, and I'm a social worker. And so we had such different experience, but we, when we educated each other and we, we kind of, there was kind of like no stupid question um, and it, it felt very safe in that way. So I'd like to continue to be able to talk about like, so, you know, what are the advantages of bringing forward a policy? And then, you know, the other thing that I loved is that I felt like before staff felt just as comfortable putting forward your ideas and your capacities and limitations. So, yeah, yeah. so I mean, like I can even start on this, like just looking at this so we can get into some of the conversation. I will tell you the COVID paid sick, uh, paid sick leave ordinance, we did that until um, we get closer to September. That itself is not going to take a whole lot of time for us. It's just is what it is. Um, so then we begin looking now down to some of those other things, um, uh, which I'll get to in a second. But um, the, I will say what I anticipate on this current list is going to take us a while. And it's um, is that we're going to we need to develop that second phase of child care. Uh, the child care support uh, pilot program. Um, we still have $1.3 million and our fear was, um, so we got the grants going, we got the trainings going and that's great, but it's the really hard part is that longevity of, um, of now uh, offering a program that allows us to um, reduce the cost of building new child care centers, and then also retaining like um, rehab grants to retain or help other people either expand or keep um, the sites that we have. So again, it's like an affordable housing program. Um, but the, uh, you know, my hope is that um, with first five, four C's um, and the chambers, um, like Ananda has uh, sweet from the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber has been one of the, the core people in, in um, helping develop this, that through this group, we can really figure it out um, and with the help of developers um, that we can figure it out. I actually think that's gonna take us some time and I feel like it's, um, we're gonna need to keep that one on this um, with some dedicated staff time um, It's and it's funded. The Rosalind initiatives, you heard Raphael talk about that. Those are ongoing um, and, um, you know, so again, it'll, it, it's um, concerted staff effort from multiple layers. Um, the Out There SR, Inside Out There programs, um, we've taken that on in-house that now lives with Tara Thompson, our uh, arts and culture manager. Um, and we see, see uh, opportunities around that. Um, it's not something that is gonna be, um, it's just an ongoing program, um, but this is where we start to see um, opportunity around both COVID and non-COVID. So it's kind of ongoing. Um, it doesn't rise to the level of like, we really need to push this through of uh, childcare in Roseland. And then mobile vending and food trucks, Raphael's working on that. Again, that's sort of an ongoing programmatic element. Um, it slips over into other departments. So we're working with um, recreation, we're working with, um, the uh, other uh, divisions in planning, uh, engineering, uh, and uh, building on those things. So those those two out of programs are ongoing. Child care and Roseland initiatives are going to need more. They're going to be more um, active. And then the projects, I'll set those aside for now because those are hefty. Um, <laughs> they're also ongoing. Um, they come in fits and spurts, um, uh, but. Uh, but you know we're just keeping those those balls juggling. Okay. And we so and, and, and we also are dealing with each of these um, on an ongoing basis at the council level as well. So exactly. even though they they sit with us in a sense of if something comes up regarding these issues, it might pop into our agenda. But indeed, those five issues are always on our tongues um, at the council during the council meetings at one point or another one of these is going to be discussed. It just, it's, it's just what we're dealing with now. Exactly. And it's interesting because they're, they're you know, especially the first, um, the second two, the, uh, the second and third one, the RPQ for downtown properties and infill, that's a thing on its own. Um, you know, we're always looking for revenue opportunities. But when you're looking at like, say, activate um, vacant under, underutilized space, it's interesting, like how, um, who's taking what um, at any given time within the city. So sometimes it's a, it's a land use question. Sometimes it's a building question. Um, sometimes it's just purely an economic uh, initiative. 
Um, so that's why I'm sort of setting those aside and we'll, we'll, they'll come up as we go along. So knowing that it programmatically, it's mostly childcare in Roseland right now. Um, and then from a policy perspective, now we have a couple of new things that are up for consideration. I think that's maybe where we wanna focus. Um, and, and are there any new things that are coming in? Yeah, and some of these things in the green also um, are being dealt with uh, by the downtown action organization. Um, although we have our, our responsibility is broader than just downtown, we do tend to focus on our downtown area for those um, those those vacant or under underutilized spaces. But we but we do need to think, especially when it, when it comes to Roseland, for instance, we need to broaden our horizons when, on, on some of these conversations to make sure that they are pertinent. Um, and applicable to other other parts of town that are very visible and perhaps need some sprucing up or some uh, uh, ways to repurpose those, um, at least, even if it's temporary. So uh, that's, yeah. it's a big, it's a big, it sounds, it kind of sounds simple because it's only four words, but that's <laughs> a big project. But even if the chamber is doing it, like taking the lead, Raphael or I are always on those, or almost always on those committees, like if it comes to things, because it's there's usually a policy piece to it or a streamlining yeah. piece or whatever it is. Yeah. No, and, 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 the, and, and, the, and John just mentioned something very important it, it, that we're focusing, let's say for the downtown, we need to focus on Roseland. What's important about the list that I see before me is if we do a clean sweep with everything included, we're actually taking care of two things at once. For example, when we talk about the, the vacant under, underused spaces, we have the vending and food trucks that could occupy if it was a land use issue. Uh, okay. The child care is definitely a top priority of, of the Roseland uh, area. So that's actually kind of incorporated into the initiatives itself. And, and I definitely see, again, the activation of underused spaces with mobile food trucks kind of goes in line with the revenue and, and pursuit of those opportunities. So I definitely do see of us being able to take a, a larger view of how we can actually incorporate more of our issues into, into these projects. And um, I think that, that that is a perfect, I'm gonna dovetail right onto that and ask the broader question or point out kind of the obvious here, which is that uh, we certainly don't lack ideas and initiative. What we do seem to, um, what sort of stands out to me is that we have more good stuff on our plate than we can really uh, financially afford um, and more than we have. I mean, I, I'm impressed always that you and Raphael and Tara and Eileen get as much done as you do. I really, sometimes I, I wonder how you guys do it. Um, <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not trying to flatter you. I really don't know how it all gets done. Um, and so my, where I'm going with this is like, there's this, you know, nearly $2 trillion of COVID relief and I know that they didn't leave cities out of it this time. Do we have any sense of like how we can, I know we work with the chambers, um, how we can work with other jurisdictions, how we can uh, harness any potential funding to, to put some more um, either staff or funding behind some of these initiatives and prioritize them in a way that will, will best and most equitably drive uh, economic recovery uh, and resilience for, for Santa Rosa. Yeah, I actually printed out and now somehow cannot find what I printed out. Um, the new, um, what was just passed um, the, through the Senate is going to the House. Um, there is a whole bunch of new, um, new funding that's available. Ah, I lost it. Um, just tell me it's a lot and then. <laughs> but it's a lot, but it's, I mean, a lot of it is how do we, um, how do we, okay, here it is. So there's like, it's a lot of it um, is new opportunities for businesses within the community or things that don't necessarily come in through the city. And even if we do get additional funds, like um, the childcare thing, we, we did that through the CARES Act money, right? So mm -hmm. it does rely on, and when we have those opportunities, it's the creative reuse based on council, um, council goals. And in that way, I think we need to wait till we see what those council goals are and what new sort of um, uh, 
funds are coming back to the um, to local municipalities, um, and they're they're doing better about not having it go state, and then the county has to ask for it, and the cities have to ask for it. They're doing better about recognizing that sort of local control of some of the funds. I don't know what those are yet. What do I do. Have, uh -huh. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, do you have a sense of when we might hear? Because I think that um, this goal setting conversation would be um helpful to have like the piece of information like the the report out from council goal setting and then the um the the sixth cares act or the is it the fifth or the sixth whatever the joe biden's cares act um relief and and have a sense of those things so that we could sort of more um i mean and it'll change but so we can um, more directly target what we can do what we can't do and what we wish we could do but we'll have to wait yeah, I don't know. Let me ask Adrian, um, the intergovernmental um, oh, yeah. person. Yeah, because I think she might have a better understanding of that element of it. I haven't been tracking. Um, MMO should be able to, to shoot you an email. Yeah, and I haven't been tracking um, what the, you know, what monies might be coming. Because um, MMO sent us something, but it, again, it's like, um, it's things that we could tap into or that businesses could directly tap into. I don't know that second, or if there's another tranche of funds that are coming directly to cities. Mm -hmm. And if there is, how much that is. Okay. Because like what just passed, what I do know is that it's like um, 15 billion for um, economic injury disaster loans. Those are those idle loans. Those are what businesses apply for. Um, there's gonna be 28.6 billion in direct grant funding for restaurants. Um, there's um, uh, 1.25 billion for shuttered venue operator grants. Um, so where, the, where in these things is there an opportunity for the city to, to um, play in that space or even the chamber or any of our private sector partners or is it directly to those businesses um, that have to actually apply alone like as a business owner? Right. Well, what might be helpful is once we have a sense of what those, because I thought that there was going to be some direct relief to cities, which I thought so too. Um, I, I would be surprised if there's not, but then again, maybe I shouldn't be surprised. But the, um, if there is not, one of the things that might be helpful is to understand what the programs are and if we have any wiggle room to leverage, like if there's tax credits somewhere, like how we are able to craft our COVID relief policy, or if maybe there's something around childcare or minority owned businesses where we can maybe have people, you know, if they apply for that grant and achieve another one of our policy goals or outcomes that, that they could get a little bit something else or they could have, um, you know, permit, um, be permitted more quickly or um, have priority is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And, you know, like I had to say on that, so childcare has been noted, uh, has, is, there are elements of both state and federal program for childcare, like um, they're expanding the childcare tax credit, um, those kinds of things. But they're also, and um, I don't have the details on these yet, but they're also creating additional programs because they recognize childcare is such a huge issue. And then I think the other thing is, is like, um, the Economic uh, Development Agency, like the federal EDA grants, like, oh, uh, if there's, like, if, if, like, there's money on the table sometimes for those huge federal grants, mm -hmm. but when um, they have um, match requirements frequently, and two, sometimes the parameters of them, it's um, so, uh, like, we don't have the resources within the city um, even if we were able to apply for it and get it to actually do the programmatic elements of it. And so that's where we have to start weighing into, um, like if it's, there's a big difference on the, um, you know, direct relief to cities funds and what we can do with that, then the um, confines of a federal grant program or even a state grant program where we would have to have programmatic elements that we may not have in place. And I think I want to also just point out, we need to be careful about expectations around those kinds of funds. Yeah. Well, anyway, I think I might have created more problems and solutions, but uh, I think the takeaway for me is that that hopefully we'll have a little bit more information in our subsequent, to, if not the next meeting, then the following meeting. 
Yeah, let me ask Adrian. But uh, you know, you um, you never create more problems than solutions. You just open up uh, the opportunity to explore a little bit deeper. So that's such um, a. You could be a politician, right, Isa? <laughs> <laughs> I am in that world, politician. I totally um, agree. <laughs> Because you know we don't. There's so many more questions than, that, than there are answers, and it seems like the, an, the the questions and the answers seem to be changing on a regular basis. It's really, really hard to keep track of what's going on, and we don't know it till we know it, and sometimes we don't know it till it's gone. So it, it's it's really. It, it I would think it would take a full time person in the city to to do nothing but track possibilities of 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 funds, where they're going, and how to get them. So it's a it's a really important question, I think, because we. We are, in, in many ways, we are, uh, for some of our bigger programs, we are um, dependent on outside funding mechanisms. So it's because the city's not exactly flush um, all the time. And right now we're, you know, that's what, part of what we're, what we're fighting with or what we're dealing with. So um, I think it's a great question, a great um, comment. Um, Eileen, do you mind taking down the um, slides and then we can go back to just the general conversation? Because I think the next part that I, thank you so much. Um, the next part that I kind of want to talk about, though, is this idea of how, okay, so we know that more, um, you know, initiatives or requests or ordinances are going to be coming to us. So, like, I feel like um, because it came up um, at the beginning, like the right to recall or right to retention, um, those kinds of things, like um, how, even if we're not talking about that directly or specifically today, how do we look at those um, in terms of the long-term trajectory and in consideration of the things that we just talked about, our resources, whether it be staff or money, right? Um, is the ability to look at these things over the long haul, not to be, because um, I think we're moving out of the urgency ordinance reactive stage, right? So then um, I feel like it, uh, do we have an opportunity then to sort of look further out? Um, and I use, uh, I think, when I think about this, I think about minimum wage. Minimum wage, we had a long lead time. We were able to, yes, hear what labor or workforce sort of interests were, but we were able to have a really broad, inclusive, considerable, uh, you know, or considered discussion with business as well, with, with, um, with uh, business owners. Like as we're looking at the, these things or as more uh, uh, ideas like social equity ordinance kind of things come in, how do we place those in consideration of the long-term um, sort of needs and being thoughtful on it? Um, and so like I say that, like when I hear about the right to recall and those types of things, you know, I start thinking about, okay, um, is now the time? It's not an, is it an urgency thing right now? Um, right, you know, is this something that, yes, I understand it might be something that's happening throughout California, but um, right now, is it right for us? Our unemployment is at 6% or it's, I think it's, um, I just looked it up like 6.3% or something like that, right? 6.5% um, um, as of February. Um, our long-term average is about 5%. Where we've been, um, uh, where we've been for the last number of years pre-COVID was at 2%. It means here, we haven't even been able to have enough employees, right? We People, we are told all the time, we can't recruit people. And anytime a new hotel pops up, literally the question we're asked is, how do we get more employees? It's not can we retain them? It's that they're being um, stolen, for lack of a better word, <laughs> from other areas. When the, um, when the casino opened up, there was a big fear that there would be a rush there and then all the other hotels would be under, um, under uh, staffed, for example. Um, so, you know, it's, it's those kinds of things like where does that land in, um, how do we consider it given maybe those kind, that kind of framework? Or is the question, um, yes, let's look at that, but first we have to understand what's the affordability of living here? What's our housing kind of things? Do we look first at those and build the foundational pieces to get us to the place where we now then are um, beyond a question of, um, of like basically full employment? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, how do you think about that? And I'm just using those in, as an example, because I'm pretty sure more 
ordinance ideas will come up. Eddie, did, did you have your hand up? Did you want to make a comment? No, sir, I didn't. I didn't have my hand okay. up, but but I will say that I think it's important to keep an eye on each and every one of the sectors. One of the things that worries me personally as, as a business owner is the, the Biden check or, or the Trump check even. I look at those as a Band-Aid uh, to cover the reality of our, our true economic situation. I do believe that Sonoma County has been spared from the reality of the unemployment because one, our houses keep burning down and there's construction work, uh, speaking very frankly. And, and two, we live in Sonoma County. So regardless, we're, 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 we're blessed. But it does worry me that if we were to have a shortfall, what would our true economic situation be? And, and for that reason, I do believe that's important to make sure that our employments our employees are taken care of. It is, if it needs to be on the top of the list at this precise moment, that would depend on what other issues are present. Uh, one of the things that I'm looking at is the HR 1319 from Biden and what that means to the influx of, of funding. Should it, he sign it on, on the 14th, I believe, in five days, I believe that's what I've been hearing. What, what happens with that influx of, of revenues? Do we cover our shortfalls? Uh, I believe it, it, it does incorporate the cities and the government and the counties in, in that funding, 60, 60 billion if I'm not mistaken, but this is just what was passed by the Senate and I believe it still had to go through the house. Uh, I'm not aware if that's actually already happened or not. But all those, all those factors kind of work into the, how important is this, how important is that? And I think we shouldn't lose sight of any of the factors and move them along evenly or, or equally if we can, if it's at all possible or feasible. Uh, so me personally, don't lose track of anything. And if yeah. we can get anything passed and take it off the list, such as the, the list that we just seen a bit ago with the green, that those are projects that were working black, simply we don't have the funding for that. And that's reality. But if we can move it along, I would suggest moving it along and taking it out the way and, and just having, having it uh, already done so we can focus on the other. Thanks, Eddie. And you know, I, I have a question, Raisa. Um, as far as opening up, where are we with our hotels? As far as what is the current status of restrictions on hotels um, and numbers of you know the occupation, the, the occupation of those rooms, and wh where where do we stand as far as opening up right now with hospitality? Yeah. I have to double check. I mean, I know we're about to enter the red tier, um, which opens things up more. And I think until we get there, I think they're only allowed to have um, like uh, essential workers. Though, to be honest with you, I've been driving around and seeing more people <laughs> where I'm uh, sure it's not necessarily just essential or something like that. I think it's essential travel. Um, but when uh, I think by the mid uh, end of March, we're allowed to be, uh, it, it opens up again, if I recall. Okay, because then it's one of those questions. These these broader or these in, important discussions, but also um, sensitive discussions, are you know we're, my guess is they will we can we can make a recommendation and we can we can fact find. And one of the things that I'm not really aware of are all of the um, the uh, right to recall and the right to retention um, and. Victoria mentioned it earlier in my role as an as an employer. I consider it an overreach of government, and I it, it really it. I think we 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 need to spend a lot of time in making in, in protecting our our uh, employees, and we also have to be sensitive to the rights of employers. And so, telling them who they will bring back and who they won't bring back, um, telling them that in being having government in, instruct them as to their employees and how they're going to hire them or not. Um, or it is just strikes me as inappropriate, as an inappropriate um, arm of the government uh, telling uh, people in the, in, the, in the business sector what to do with their employees. So having a broader conversation about that, perhaps at council, I mean, we could do it here too. What I'm worried about is that we're gonna, is timing. If there is a desire on the, on the council's part or on this body to move that issue forward, we're going to start running if there are protections that 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 council members feel need to be put into place we need to be starting that conversation now because as we open up that question will have to be will needs to be answered um so that's why I, I, even though i would like to avoid um an urgency ordinance because we we keep doing that and it's going to start i, I mean i don't want everything we do to be urgent 
um, we need, it would be nice to be able to have the, the uh, a little bit of time that which means that we would need to start that conversation sooner than later, uh, especially if we're going to move in that direction. And I am I for one, I'm uncomfortable with that direction. I would, I would love to be able to encourage, but to require um, is, puts me on edge. Um, any other, any comments, uh, yeah. Um, members? Yeah, if I might, um, you know, what I think with this one is that what, what I was hoping to accomplish today in this regard is to um, ask to put it on the next agenda so that we could just collect more information rather mm -hmm. than um, making a decision today. Because it is, you know, it's a really narrow um, scope of who would be affected by it. Yeah. Um, but um, I've been given information about how sensitive these workers are and how um, how much of an impact it, it might have. And to um, Raisa's point um, that, you know, about unemployment being low, unemployment is not is, is low and we're, we're blessed here, but it's not uniformly low. And some business owners and some employees have been so much harder hit than others. And so <clears throat> while, um, you know, my, my primary um, dislike of this proposition has to do with the fact that it's, it's actually really narrow and it doesn't help enough people um, and that there's already a, a lot of things going on. Um, you know, I do think that it would be helpful to sort of bring it to us like fresh because I, I know that when we sort of take it up in this, you know, like it's really sort of being used as in this conversation as a side, like, okay, well, here's all these other things that are coming up. Um, and so I, I was hoping to deal with it in the, in the more linear way, like, okay, let's, let's look at this next time instead of having to react to it today. Um, and so I think the, the original question was, how do we, you're going to, I'm losing track. How, how do we, how do we decide what we're doing? Well, no, I mean, I think, I think we'll decide sort of organically this way. It helps to know this. So I will definitely agendize it for the next one um, so that we can have a more specific conversation. And then in the meantime, try to do some work. Yeah, and to be clear, I mean, it's, I was trying to um, think about it in terms of like any, uh, anything and that just uh, any kind of ordinance that we might have to consider and trying to think about it in the long term. Some of them, uh, maybe it was a bad example, but some might be urgency and some may not be urgent, right? right. Um, but it's just how do we, how are we best able to have the conversation, consider them um, uh, more fully with community engagement? Um, or engaging the stakeholders that it may or may not affect, right? Um, so I think that's my key piece of it. Um, mm -hmm. But to your question, I actually, yeah, this helps because even this conversation helps me understand like where, where does it place for you? What is it? And then let's agendize it and then um, discuss okay. it further. And then the, the longer term thing is if it's not like a clear urgency or something that's specifically directed, uh, you know, related to COVID. Um, uh, I think um, Eddie kind of talked about this a little bit is like, okay, let's hold it. Let's know that we need to do it. Let's go back and understand um, what's swirling uh, around it or if there are initial things that we need to do and then we can consider it. Can, can we sort of have, and there will be a, you know, a Venn diagram, but can we sort of have a COVID track and an economic, a general economic development track? Yeah, I was thinking like COVID and then it's like economic resiliency um, because I think that sort of like, I was trying to tie it back to that, that conversation at council. So yeah, let me see if I can come up with something in that way. And it is a bit Zen <laughs> diagram like. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I really um, agree with John about is that, and you, is that I would like there to be fewer urgency things going on. Um, it's really difficult, um, especially, I mean, it was hard because we had, we actually had emergencies before and now it's harder because you know, if I get a call or, um, you know, business or workers groups or whatever, you know, then it's, you know, it's in, in the, because of the nature of the subcommittee, I can't just call John and say, hey, can you agendize this? It's like, well, I will ask to have it agendized during the meeting. And then, you know, next meeting, we will take it up if the committee so chooses. And so that pushes things out. Um, but I, I do agree that it's better to, uh, to the degree that we can 
see things ahead of time. And I don't know if there's a better mechanism if I should just contact you directly. Yeah, because remember like anytime we'd have it. And so we're, we're running out of time, but I will point out like I, I put on here, or it's, um, it's on the um, slide, which you can just look at, like the Cal Chambers recommendations. So, you know, we can look at that and we'll re agendize it for next time we want to look at anything. But oftentimes that's how we get stuff. Just call me direct because I can just put it on a list and we can, we can carve out time every time to say, yeah, okay, so these are the new things. Because like, remember how long that task force was? was? And I'd be like, you want to pull it out? Or it's, you know, let's keep it there. But now we have an opportunity. And so sometimes it would be months. And then like, then suddenly it was like, that was the most urgent thing. And it was on a parking lot for months. Okay, thank yeah. you. That, that's, yeah, I, I think I, I love that that process. It's good, it's open and freewheeling. And, and, and I think that the, um, uh, the, the reality, not only do we, I mean, now we're gonna wait a month, the, the, the Open Government Task Force and their findings and their recommendations, getting something on the agenda for the council takes almost a month. I mean, it's literally, it's, not, it's three weeks More plus. More than a month. It's, yeah, so it's, it's <laughs> really, I mean, it's, it, as, as an Open Government is very, very important and it's definitely gonna slow down even more than it was before, so we have, it's, 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 that is something that we need to be mindful of. And that's probably in part why we have been more urgency oriented because some of these things couldn't wait. And there will be members of the community that believe that this is another issue that can't wait. And that's part of what I need to find out in, in this fact finding in the next meeting when we have it at the, at the top of our agenda, I believe. So that, because, so we have time to at yeah. least flesh it out uh, um, as much as possible. Um, cause it's going to, it'll, it'll take some time. Um, yeah, so we need I to think get going. We'll have those council goals by the next, by the April meeting. Um, I know we're out of time, but Ananda Sweet has had her name, her hands up. Um, yes. So, um, if we want to do that public comment. Yeah. Let's, let's move to public comment. If you're okay with that council. Okay. okay. Uh, good morning, Ananda Sweet, Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. First, I do want to thank this council member and staff team for your dedication to the city's economic development efforts at this you know, really critical time, and specifically for your focus and conversation on business support, development opportunities, and child care as just really critical issues to our economic recovery. As you explore additional policy and regulation uh, related to employers and workforce, I would urge uh, that it's crucial to engage employers as part of the process. You know, to truly understand any workforce problem we're trying to solve and to work with and engage employers as part of that solution. Uh, it's particularly critical to take the time to ensure that any policy solutions that come from this process meet the intended purpose while avoiding uh, unintended negative consequences. Specific to right of recall, I do have to be clear that any form of right of recall ordinance would be extremely burdensome for employers who should be encouraged rather than discouraged from reopening or ramping back up uh, to pre-pandemic staffing levels. Um, any ordinance that adds layers of process, you know, time delays, a loss of flexibility, absolutely do represent an enormous cost and burden to employers when they can least afford it uh, and would risk further delays or permanent loss of those positions rather than protecting them. Uh, again, here we would urge you to truly understand any problem you're trying to solve, including the data to support its, its existence, um, and truly understanding the consequences of any policy solution and the impact of layers of new policy. Um, thank you again for your time this morning. And of course, you know, we stand ready to work with you to initiate and support our economic recovery. And of course, to work on our shared goals of supporting a thriving Santa Rosa for all. Thanks, Ananda. Eileen, do we have any more public comment on this item? Uh, I don't see any. I apologize. Uh, there are no additional hand raised hands at this time. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, well, we're, we're at the end of our hour and a half. They always tend to fly by and it's, it's one, of the, one of the more rewarding uh, endeavors that, that, that I get to enjoy uh, is working with this group. Uh, so thank you staff and, and thanks Eddie and Victoria for you know, all your hard work. Raisa and Rafael, you, you guys you know, always make for a, a, a great meeting. And uh, so we'll, we got, we have a lot on our plate, and but we're used to that, and we will we will get through it. Uh, so we'll make sure that that item um, gets on the, our agenda for, for our next meeting. Uh, we'll prioritize that and give it as much space as, as much time as we possibly can. In fact, if there's any if there's any anything that we can not deal with on that day, 
um, would probably be would be good. And if we end up uh, exhausting our need for information uh, and fact finding, uh, then we'll just the, the meeting can will just will potentially just end a little early. So, um, Victoria. Yeah, um, and then um, because there was, had been the request for PLA and we just kind of like add things to the laundry list um, of, of stuff that we're working on. What I couldn't remember with that one before I requested it to be agendized is I thought that the council talked about that during our goal setting. And I thought that I heard for at least four people say that they wanted us to explore that or that wanted the council to explore that. Do you know, Raisa, if that's been referred to the Economic Development Subcommittee? Yeah, that I. it has not been, I, I, this was really the first that I heard about it. I think it was asked last night, is this a consideration? It has not come to me, so I don't know where it would go. So when we come back next time, could we um, have, um, you said that we will have the council goals next time or the meeting after? I think we're gonna have the council goals before that, but I can double check. I can ask that PLA question. What would be um, helpful is to know is if the council gave, because that's such a large body of work to consider. Yes. Um, if the council did suggest it, if um, you could check with the mayor and see if he would like it to be in this subcommittee or if he had a different process in mind for addressing that goal. Okay. I, do, I, my, I, do, I think I have some clarification on, the, on what to expect as far as coming from the, our council goal setting. I think I, by our next meeting, there sh we should have a, an articulation of what, of what is in our wheelhouse, but as far as the staff, uh, how they their work plan would not be uh, would not be available until the following month. So that's I think that's two months away. But I think that our a good a good snapshot of what is in our wheelhouse, I believe, will be available for our next meeting. Okay. Include and and potentially because I do remember that conversation around the PLAs as well. And so potentially that that clarification will be uh, forthcoming for our next meeting. Okay, great. Okay. I'll double check as well. And so at the very least, we'll just have the um, the hospitality right to recall and right to retain a uh, retention. And then um, also just the council goals, just so that we have that on there. And then yeah. what I'll try to do is um, we don't need to use the um, presentation, but I'll try to do a presentation kind of format. So there's an attachment um, that has that our ongoing list so that we always have available to you and the public um, anything that's on our on our ongoing list. And I'll try to bucket it that way. And I'll try to add that Venn diagram. You know, and and if, if we could, and I hate to add to your work and maybe this will actually be good for clarification. Um, for instance, the the issue around uh, the, um, and I, I, my screens are starting to go dark, um, that was actually in our arts um, being handled by uh, Tara, Tara or Tara. Uh -huh. I always get them mixed Tara. up. Um, Tara, thank you. Um, and I apologize, Tara. Um, th that we, th you might even mention, you know, where it, because it looks like it's sitting in our list, but it's actually being handled elsewhere. So it's a little, if we could add somehow a little bit of clarifying comment about where it's actually living currently um, would would help not make our list look so, uh, it, would, it, would, it would add clarity to the list. Um, and also give us a, a sense of who's kind of working on it currently. What you're talking about the out there stuff? Is yeah, that uh, yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. If Got possible. It. I mean, if not, it's not like an urgent thing, but it's it just it adds clarity to our list. Yeah, and if you have a, if you want me to form that list in any other way than what I'm seeing, because it's just been sort of an ongoing thing, I could definitely do that. I really I, I like the way it looks uh, personally, okay. but, but okay. no, it's it, we can we can evolve. Okay. <laughs> I, thank you all very, very, very much. I really appreciate it. It was a great meeting and we will see you um, before then, but uh, until our next meeting. Perfect. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.